Hi everybody, welcome to this week's presentation. As you uh, would have seen, this is going to be on what defines your morals. And I'm going to share a presentation with you, uh, which will start with the slide that uh, you'd normally see. But uh, yeah, here's our title slide then, what defines your morals? And it's, it's a challenging question, isn't it? That probably at different times of our lives, all of us have to give some thought to in terms of just trying to think, well, what is the right thing to do? What's the right and what is wrong? And it's very clear from surveying humanity that we don't naturally know what's right and wrong. I'm sure any parent would say that they have to guide their children with that. Uh, I'm a teacher and I can certainly assure you that we have to guide our pupils. But the very fact that we were once those children tells you that we're imperfect too. If you think that there's anybody out there who is perfect, who's got it all right, well, we'd want them to be world leader, wouldn't we? But, but there isn't. All of us get things wrong. None of us are perfect. Look how clear that the Bible is on this. Look at the Bible teaching here. Uh, I'm going to read from my screen here. That there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. There is no one who does not sin. All have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. So nobody in history or alive today has ever been perfect. Well, there is an exception and we will come on to that. But we may at this stage think, well, if we're all imperfect, let's stop worrying about morality. Let's give up the search. That's a cop out. But we can see that from looking around us, it's simply impossible to find a perfect standard on which to base our morals on. But that in itself is quite revealing because it also shows that each of us recognise that there is and needs to be a standard of right and wrong. So the very fact that we're saying we can't see a standard of right or wrong tells us, but we recognise there is a standard of right and wrong. So how do we establish our moral compass? Who do we look to? Where do we look to to decide on what's right and wrong? Do we go to the government and law? Now, of course, it has a point, and we're glad that there are laws in place. But, but what if you live in a country which is super suppressive and you end up disagreeing with the laws? How do you decide what's right from wrong? What about the masses? Isn't that the point of democracy? But no, actually realise that doesn't work either. Lots of imperfect people coming together isn't going to make a perfect standard. Two rights don't make or two wrongs don't make a right. That's the thing, isn't it? You know, that, that, that people say. And actually, certainly if you've got uh, a million wrongs, it's not going to make a right. And there are countless examples through history and in the present day where, where the collective voice has done far more damage than good. OK, well, sh should we look to the media? Journalists reflecting on society. But our press have polar opposite views. Proof alone that it's pointless to look there for a standard. OK, in education. Well, no, children sit in one lesson and uh, we're told that they come from a big bang over billions of years. You know, just by fluke, uh, this happened and that produced life, which produced apes, which produced men. Uh, and then they're told to go into another lesson and told, pray to God as a creator. Uh, do you think that consistency helps to define morals? Of course not. Well, what about science? Does science have the answers? And again, we're not looking to knock scientists, but once again, realise it's futile, futile to pretend that science is the moral decider. Hitler's Nazi Germany was based on the science of creating the perfect race. And of course, that's incredibly extreme. But the point is that man cannot be relied on. And hopefully, when you're looking at those things, you realise man is the common factor, man with a capital M, mankind. We are at the heart of the problem. And however we look at it, we'd come to realise that we do need an external standard, one that has come from outside our imperfect circumstance. Look how clear the Bible is about not trusting in man. Psalm 118, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. 
trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath. In other words, man is mortal. Why, why are we trusting in mortal man? For of what account is he? So you see how clear the Bible is. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in yourself. But thankfully, the Bible also makes clear that there is a perfect standard, and that is God's. And so you see the rock speaking of God. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. The law of the Lord is perfect. And these verses are showing too to us, aren't they, that the standard of God has been shown to us through his word. But wonderfully too, God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, showed us that standard in his life. So he could be called the word made flesh. God's perfect standard, which is shown in his word, was upheld by the Lord Jesus Christ. He never sinned. He is the one exception in all of human history. And through his close relationship to God, he overcame the temptation to do wrong and he lived a perfect life. And so then the Bible teaches that there is such a thing as right and wrong. There is morality. And it's super clear that God's character is perfect and that we are all imperfect. We must all accept, uh, accept that we are sinners. We are imperfect. We fall short of God's perfect standard. And accepting that is crucial. God wants us to recognise it. Have the humility, therefore, to stop pretending, stop kidding ourselves that we have all the answers or that humanity has the answers. And recognise that we need to turn to God. Well, in an effort to undermine a defined morality, Western society in particular has pushed a, a kind of nonsense idea. It's this. Their idea is that the right thing to do is to say that no one can claim what is right or wrong. But of course, there's a huge irony to that claim, because if you're saying that no one can claim right or wrong, well, why should we listen to you? Can you see how disingenuous that idea is? There must be right and wrong simply for someone to make that statement. So, so let's not make believe and say that there's no such thing as a truth. Of course there is. Even the person who wants to tell you that there are many truths is hoping that you're going to believe their truth. The question isn't, is there truth? Obviously there is. The question is, what is the truth? And the Bible claims to be truth. Is there evidence to believe it? Yes, absolutely. There's clear evidence to believe that the Bible is true. And again, it's for a separate presentation. But there's all sorts of things that you can look at. Is there reason to believe it? Yes, absolutely. It's compelling. It's a guide for our lives. It gives us hope for the future. It's wonderful. The Lord Jesus Christ said, the truth will set you free. Now, how thrilling is that? That actually we can be liberated by learning the truth, by understanding there is a standard. Now, perhaps one of the reasons that we don't want to clearly define morals as humans is because perhaps we don't want to come across as exclusive. You can almost understand that a bit, can't we? We want to be liked, don't we? And we hope that by saying that, well, look, look, just let everybody choose. If everyone can choose their own way, then we're perhaps being a bit less judgmental and we're being super loving as people. But one writer made a good point about the apparent conflict for some in understanding how freedom is not simply to do what you like. He put it like this. He said, if you take a fish in a lake and say to that fish, look, you're missing out on so much. Let me liberate you from the constraints of the lake. Run free with me. 
down this path. Let me show you the hills and the forests around you in more detail. Well, that poor fish is going to die. The point is this. The fish will die if we don't honour the reality of its nature. We can think of another example. To tell a parent to give their child absolute freedom. If that child ends up on the edge of a motorway, was that such a good idea? Tell a teacher to give their class absolute freedom. They can choose to do whatever they want all day, every day. Is that a good idea? Why would we pretend that freedom is to do whatever we like? It's not. That's chaos. It's confusion. We need boundaries. And the slightest bit of thought shows that. Well, well, God, like the loving father that he is, has set clear boundaries. He's defined right and wrong. And he knows that if we live by the standards which he set out, then ultimately it will be better for us, just as the teacher knows that for the class, it will be better for them, as the parent knows for the child, it's better for them, as the person looking at the fish knows, it's better for them. God has set standards, and he knows that it's better for us to stay within those standards. If we all go our own way, we're in a mess which ends up in death and no hope. The Christadelphians, whilst of course imperfect in every way, are trying to hold on to God's standards. They're not trying to make their own standards. They're saying, let's go back to the truth that's in the Bible. Let's forget church tradition. Let's forget man's teachings in general. Let's go back to what the Bible says and where the Bible is consistent with man's teachings, fine, that's good, we go along with it. But where the man's teachings is saying, okay, do this or go down that, or we're now saying this is okay, or this standard of life is okay, we go back to the Bible. And so our fellowship as a community and our lives as individuals are bound up in God's word. We don't say it doesn't matter. You can believe what you like or live how you like, make up values to suit you. You see, for Christadelphians, rather than see the standard as a constraint, we see it as truth, a truth which liberates. And so it's a privilege to try to follow the example that the Lord Jesus Christ showed us. And again, I'll, I'll say, we do it imperfectly, all of us are imperfect, but we keep going back to that standard. It's so obvious how much better society would be if we put his teaching into practice. He's the only perfect person to have walked this earth. He is the leader that we want. And so our message is to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop kidding ourselves that me, you or anyone else for that matter has the answers. You and I are imperfect. Hence, the Bible says that it's not in man to direct his steps. There's some uh, points there about the Lord Jesus Christ teaching. And you, again, look at those things and think, what a better way that is. Why don't we try to follow and embrace following the Lord Jesus Christ? And as I've already said, that the Bible is very clear that it's not in man to direct yourself. Morality, right and wrong, is not going to come from us. We need that external standard. We need God's standard. So put your trust in God. And what's more, you'll realise that God doesn't change. He's a rock on which we can build our lives and guide our families. What's more, although it's a subject for another time, as you read your Bible and come to learn more about God, you'll realise that he has a wonderful plan and purpose for all those who choose his ways. So thank you for listening. And I hope that in your endeavours to find truth, you will turn to the Bible.